Flying Saucers by C.G. Young, forward to the Signet edition. Why would one of the grand old men of modern psychology sit down in the last years of his life and analyze the guidance, the significance of flying saucers, UFOs, or unidentified flying objects, to man's unconscious mind, because it fascinated him, because he saw the many reports on the sighting of flying saucers, and he started to puzzle about the people who said they had seen them, because he found it intriguing to speculate on what within ourselves it seems to demand that such things as UFOs are real, because he sensed that the deep emotional appeal with such extraterrestrial vehicle, extraterrestrial, terrestrial, terrestrial vehicles and their supposed inhabitants have not just for those who report having seen them, but for the millions of other people throughout the globe. Carl Gustav Jung was born July 26, 1875. He died on June 6, 1961, in his native Switzerland. His life bridged the, many, the better part of a century, and he contributed richly to man's knowledge of himself, a noted psychiatrist and analyst. He received his medical degree at the University of Basel and went to Paris for psychological studies. Several universities conferred honorary degrees on Dr. Young, including in this country, Harvard, Clark, and Fordham. He was the author of many books, among them Modern Men in Search of a Soul, Psychological Types, Contributions to Analytical Psychology, Essays on Contemporary Events, The Undiscovered Self, and Answers to Job. Dr. Young lived and practiced mainly in Zurich. As one of the earlier students and collaborators of Sigmund Freud, Young soon showed his individuality and daring. In developing what became known as his analytical psychology, he contributed to such concepts, such concepts such concepts as that of introvert and extrovert personality to modern psychology. He pioneered the idea of a collective unconscious that appears to link all mankind since time immemorial. The reader will find numerous references to what Jung calls archetypes. Just what exactly are they? Jung sees them as symbols of certain basic, dramatized, unconscious images that are shared by us all. He himself was often viewed by others as one of these symbols. The wise old man, the sage, UFOs, with their otherworldly existence, are also archetypal significance to Young. C.G. Young was a medical man of wide experience, and his early training was in applied psychiatry. But he was not just concerned with the world of human illness or solely with psychotherapy, with healing in its strict sense. His ideas were sweeping and artistic. He was a philosopher-psychologist who would have delighted in the current um, upsweep of the daring ideas of painting and music, as well as the experiments in expanded consciousness and fresh modes of living. Although in his later years he emphasized that the conscious mind must ultimately decide among the volcanic uplift of images and ideas from the unconscious, it was the unconscious that truly fascinated him, and for which, in a way, he was a spokesman of our century. Young introduced oriental thought to modern psychology. He pioneered in the study of alchemy and its psychological implications. The interrelation between reality and myth was central to his work. Characteristically, then, he describes the impact which UFO's observations have made on many, the feeling of exaltation and wholeness that they conveyed, as parallel with the archetype of the Eastern mandalas in the Manhayana Buddhism. These mandalas are drawings that convey com a completeness of experience and are rounded in design to symbolize their co this concept. Recently, UFO reports have been recorded not only in many parts of the United States and Europe, but also in several Latin American countries, in Russia and in the Far East. Obviously, if flying saucers corresponded to images in our collective unconscious, they testify to the universal nature of man's unconscious needs and responses. Today, many ideas concerning this, the reality design and meaning of the UFO phenomenon are being discussed, but in psychological terms, C.G. Young is uniquely qualified to examine this subject, putting it within the framework of man's psychological history, his dreams, his fears, and his desires. It is interesting to note that, although this book, con although this book concerns in the main the psychological significance the significance of flying saucer sightings to people, Dr. Young does go so far herein as to state about UFOs, quote, if these things are real, and by all human standards, it hardly seems possible to doubt this any longer, then we are left only with two hypotheses, that their weightlessness on the one hand and their psychic nature on the other. Martin Eben.
Okay, so this book was published in 1959, forward copyright 1969. So let's go on to the preface to the English edition. The worldwide rumor about flying saucers presents a problem that challenges the psychologist with a number of, for a number of reasons. The primary question, and apparently this is the most important point, is this. Are they real or are they mere fantasy products? This question is by no means settled yet. If they are real, exactly what are they? If they are fantasy, why should such a rumor exist? In this later, latter respect, I have made an interesting and quite unexpected discovery. In 1954, I gave an interview to the Swiss weekly Die Welt Walk, in which I expressed myself in a skeptical way, though I spoke with due respect of the serious opinion of a relatively large number of air specialists who believe in the reality of UFOs, unidentified flying objects. In 1958, this interview was suddenly discovered by the world press and the news spread like wildfire from the far west and round the earth to the far east, but alas, in distorted form. I was quoted as a saucer believer. I issued a statement to the United Press and gave a true version of my opinion, but this time the wire went dead. Nobody, so far as I know, took any notice of it except one German newspaper. The moral of this story is rather interesting. As the behavior of the press is a sort of Gallup test with reference to world opinion, one must draw the conclusion that news affirming the existence of UFOs is welcome, but that skepticism seems to be undesirable. To believe that UFOs are real suits the general opinion, whereas disbelief is to be discouraged. This creates the impression that there is a tendency in all over the world to believe in saucers and to want them to be real, unconsciously helping along, helped along by a press that otherwise has no sympathy with the phenomenon. This remarkable fact in itself surely merits the psychologist's psychologi interest. Why should it be more desirable for saucers to exist than not? The following pages are an attempt to answer this question. I have really relieved the text of cumbersome footnotes, except for a few which give the references for interested readers. C.G. Young, September 1959. Introductory. It is difficult to form a correct estimate of the significance of contemporary events and the danger that our judgment will remain caught in subjectivity is great. So I am fully aware of the risk I am taking in proposing to communicate my views concerning certain contemporary events which seem to me important to those which are patient enough to hear me. I refer to those reports re reaching us from all corners of the earth, rumors of, of round objects objects that flash through the troposphere, the stratosphere, and go by the name of flying saucers, Sau saucopedes, discs, and UFOs, unidentified flying objects. These rumors or the possible psych psych physical existence of such object objects seem to me so significant that I feel myself compelled, as once before, footnotes, Wotan, essay on contemporary events, um, as once before, and footnote, when events were brewing of fateful consequence for Europe to sound a note of warning. I, I know that, just as I have before, my voice is much too weak to reach the ear of the multitude. It is not presumption that drives me, but my conscience as a psychiatrist that bids me fulfill my duty and prepare those few who will hear me for coming events which are in accord with the era of, uh, end of an era. As we know from ancient Egyptian history, there are symptoms of psychic change which always appear at the end of one platonic month and at the beginning of another. They are, it seems, changes in the constellation of psychic dominance of the archetypes of, or gods, as they used to be called, which, being about or accompany long-lasting transformation of the collective psyche. This transformation started within historical tradition and left traces behind it, first in the transition from the age of Tartarus to that of Aries, then from Aries to Pisces, whose beginning coincides with the rise of Christianity. We are now nearing the great change which may be expected with the spring, when the spring point enters Aquarius. 
It would be frivolous of me to conceal from the reader that the, that reflection, such as these are not, ex not only exceedingly unpopular, but comparisonly close to those turbid fantasies which becloud the minds of world imp improvers and other interpreters of signs and portents. But I must take this risk, even if it means putting my hard-won reputation for truthfulness, trustworthiness, and scientific judgment in jeopardy. I can assure my readers that I do not do this with a, with a light heart. I am, to be quite frank, concerned for all those who are caught unprepared by the events in question and disconcerted by in their incomprehensible nature. Since, so far as I know, no one has yet moved to examine and set forth the possible psychic consequences of this unforeseen change, I deem it my duty to do what I can in this report. I undertake this thankless task in the expedition that my chisel will make no impression on the hard stone it meets. Some time ago, I wrote a short article in which I considered the na nature of the flying saucer, and I came to the same conclusion as a semi-official report by Edward I. Ruppelt, one-time chief of the American Bureau for Observing UFOs, the report on unidentified flying objects, New York, Do Doubles Day, 1956. The conclusion is, something is seen, but one doesn't know what. It is difficult, it is not, if not impossible, to form any correct idea of these objects, because they behave not like bodies, but like weightless thoughts. Up till now, there has not been, there has been no indispensable proof of the psychic existence of UFOs, except for the cases picked up by radar. I have discussed the reliability of these radar observations with Professor Max Knoll, a specialist in this field. What he says is not encouraging. Nevertheless, there do seem to be authenticated cases where the visual observations were confirmed by radar echo. I would like to call the reader's attention to Kehoe's, Kehoe's books, which are based on official material and studiously avoid the wild speculations, naivety, or prejudice of other publications. Um, footnote Major David E. Kehoe, Flying Saucers from Outer Space, New York, 1953, and a bunch of other books by him. Okay, and for a decade, the physical reality of UFOs remained a very problematic, problematical error, which was not decided one way or the other with the necessary clarity, despite the mass observational material which had accumulated in the meantime. The longer the uncertainty lasted, the greater became the probability that this obviously complicated phenomenon had an extremely important psychic component as well as possible physical basis. This was not surprising in that we are dealing with an ostensibly physical phenomenon distinguished on the one hand by its frequent appearance and on the other by its strange, unknown, and indeed contradictory nature. Such an object provokes, like nothing else, conscious and unconscious fantasies, the former giving rise to speculative conjectures and pure fabrication, and the latter supplying the mythological background inseparable from these pro provo provocative observations. Thus there arose a situation in which, with the best will in the world, one often does not know and could not discover whether the primary perceptions was followed by a phantasm, or whether, conversely, a primary fantasy originated in the unconscious, invaded the conscious mind with illusions and visions. The material which has become known to me during the past ten years lends support to both hypotheses. In the first case, an objectively real psycho psych physical process forms the basis for an accompanying myth. In the second case, an archetype creates the corresponding vision. To these two causal relationships, we must add a third possibility, namely of a synchronistic, i.e. a causal, meaningful coincidence, a problem that has occupied men's minds ever since the time of Guy Lynx, Liebens, and Schopenhauer. <clears throat> um, it is a hypothesis which has special bearing on phenomenon connected with archetypal psychic process. So, footnote to Schopenhauer and the others. Uh, see my paper, Synchronicity and A Causal Connecting Principle, Young and Pauli Interpretation of Nature, and the Psyche, and the footnote. As a psychologist, I am not qualified to contribute anything useful to the question of the physical reality of UFOs. 
I can concern myself only with their undoubted psychic aspect, and in what follows shall deal almost exclusively with their psychic concomitants. Okay, chapter one. UFOs as rumors. Since the things reported as UFOs not only sound incredible, but seem to fly in the face of all our basic assumptions about the physical world, it is very natural that one's first reaction should be the negative one of outright rejection. Surely, we say, it's nothing but illusions, fantasies, and lies. People who report such stuff, chiefly airplane pilots and ground staff, cannot be quite right in the head. What is worse, most of these stories come from America, the land of superlatives and of science fiction. In order to meet their natural reaction, we should begin by considering the UFO reports simply as rumors, i.e. as psychic products, and shall draw from this all the conclusions that are warranted by an analytical method of procedure. Regarded in this light, the UFO reports may seem to be the skeptical to the skeptical mind to be rather like the story that is told over the, all over the world, but differs from an ordinary rumor in that it is expressed in the form of a vision, or a visions. Footnote, I prefer the term vision to hallucination because the latter bears the stamp of a pathological concept, whereas a vision is a phenomenon that is by no means particular or peculiar to a pathological state. Okay, end of, end of footnote. Or perhaps owed its existence to them in the first place and is now kept alive by them, these visions. I would call this contempor contem co uh, comparatively rare variation a visionary rumor. It is closely akin to the collective vision of, say, the Crusaders during the siege of Jerusalem, the troops at Mons in the First World War, the faithful followers of the Pope in Fatima, Portugal, etc. Apart from collective visions, there are on record cases which one or more pe persons see something that physically is not there. For instance, I was once at a spiritualistic seance where four or five people present saw an object like a moon floating above the abdomen of the medium. They showed me, the fifth person present, exactly where it was, and it was ab absolutely incomprehensible to them that I could see nothing of the sort. I knew of three more cases where certain objects were seen in the clearest detail, in two of them by two persons, and the third by one person, and could afterwards be by and could afterwards by by prove to be af, could afterwards must be be proved to be non existent. Two of these cases happened under my direct observation. Even people who are entirely compos mentis and in full possession of their senses can sometimes see things that do not exist. I do not know what the explanation is of such happenings. It is very possible that they are less rare than I was inclined to suppose. For as a rule, we do not verify things we have seen with our own eyes, but we never get to know what actually. But we, so we never get to know that they actually did not exist. I mention these somewhat remote possibilities because, in such an unusual matter as UFOs, one has to take every aspect into account. The first requisite for a visionary rumor, as distinct from an ordinary rumor, for those disseminating nothing more is needed than popular curiosity and sensation mongering, is always an unusual emotion. Its intensification into a vision and delusion of the senses, however, springs from a stronger excitement and therefore from a deeper source. The signal for the UFO stories has given, was given by the mysterious projection seen over Sweden during the last two years of the war attributed, of course, to the Russians, and then by the reports about Foo Fighters, i.e. lights that accompany the Allied bombers over Germany. Foo, it is Foo, the fire. These were followed by strange sightings of flying saucers in America. The impossibility of finding an earthly basis for the UFOs and explaining their physical peculiarities soon led to the conjecture of extraterrestrial origin. With this development, the rumor got linked with the psychology of the Great Panic that broke out in New, York, New Jersey just before the Second World War, when a radio play based on the novel by H.G. Wells about Martians invading New York caused a regular stampede with numerous car accidents. The play evidently hit the latest emotion connected with the imminence of war. The motif of an extraterrestrial invasion 
was seized upon by the rumors and the UFOs were interpreted as machines controlled by intelligent beings from outer space. The apparent weightlessness behavior of spaceships and their intelligent purpose, purposive act movements were attributed to the superior technical knowledge and ability of the cosmic intruders. As they did no harm and refrained from all hostile acts, it was assumed that their appearance over the Earth was due to curiosity or to the need for aerial reconnaissance. It also seemed the airfields and atomic installations in particular held a special attraction for them, for which it was concluded that the dangerous development of atomic physics and nuclear fission had caused a certain disquiet in our neighboring planets and necessitated a more accurate survey from the air. As a result, people felt they were being observed and spied from, upon from space. The rumor actually gained so much official recognition that service chiefs in America set up a special bureau for collecting, analyzing, and evaluating all relative observations. This seems to have been done in France, Italy, Sweden, Great Britain, and other countries. After the publication of Rupert's report, the saucer stories seem to have been more or less vanished from the press for about a year. They were evidently no longer news. That's the interest in UFOs and probably the sightings of them had not ceased is shown by the recent press reports that an American admiral has suggested that clubs he be formed over all, all over the country for collecting UFO reports and investigating them in detail. The rumor states that the UFOs are, are as a rule lens shaped but can be oblong or shaped like cigars and they can shine in various colors and have magnificent glitter. Uh, footnote. Special emphasis should be laid upon the green fireballs frequently observed in the southwest of the USA. End of footnote. And that from a stationary position they can attain a speed of about 10,000 miles per hour, and that at times their acceleration is such that if anything resembling a human being were to guide it, he would be instantly killed. In flight, they turn off, they turn off at angles that would be impossible only to wait. That would be possible only to weightless objects. Their flight accordingly represents that of a flying insect. Like this, the UFOs can suddenly hover over an interesting object for quite a time, or circle around it, around it inquisitively, just as suddenly start off again and discover new objects in the zigzag light. Flight. UFOs are therefore not to be confused with meteorites, or with reflections from so-called temperature inversion layers. Their alleged interest in air fields and in industrial installations connected with nuclear fission is not always confirmed since they are also seen in the Antarctic and Sahara and the Himalayas. For preference, however, they seem to swarm over the United States. Through recent reports show they do a good deal of flying over the Old World and the Far East. Nobody knows what they are looking for or what they want to observe. Our aeroplanes seem to arouse their curiosity, for they often fly towards them or pursue them, but they also fly away from them. Their flights do not appear to be based on any recognizable system. Their behavior, they behave more like groups of tourists, unsystematically viewing the countryside, pausing now for a while and there for a while, erratically followed first by one interest and then another, sometimes shooting at enormous altitude, for inextricable reasons or performing aerobatic evolutions before the noses of ex exasperated pilots. Sometimes they appear to be up to 500 yards in diameter and sometimes small as electric street lamps. There are large motherships from which little UFOs slip out of or in which they are take shelter. They are both said to be they are said to be both mannered and unmannered and in the latter case are remote controlled. According to the rumor they occur, the occupants are about three feet in height and look like human beings or conversely are utterly unlike us. Other reports speak of giants 15 feet high. They are beings who are carrying out a cautious survey of the earth and considerately avoid all encounters with men or mere, more menacingly are spying out landing places with a view to settling the population of a planet that has got into difficulties and in colonizing the earth by force. Uncertainly, in regard to the physical condition on Earth and their fear of unknown sources of infection, have held them back temporarily from drastic encounters and even from attempting landings, although they possess frightful weapons which would enable them to exterminate the human race.
In addition, there are the obviously superior technology, which they credit with superior wisdom and moral goodness, which would, on the other hand, enable them to save humanity. Nevertheless, there are stories of landings, too, when the saucer men were not only seen at close quarters, but attempted to carry off a human being. Even a reliable man like Kehoe gives us to understand that a squadron of five military aircraft plus a large seaplane were swallowed by a UFO membership in the vicinity of the Bahamas and carried off. One's hair stands on end when one reads such reports, together with the documentary evidence, and when one considers the known possibility of tracking UFOs with radar. Then we have all the essentials of an unsurpassing science fiction story. Every man who prides himself on his sound common sense will feel distinctly affronted. I shall therefore not enter into the various attempts at explanation to which the rumor gives, rumor gives, rumors give rise. When I was engaged in writing this essay, it so happened that two articles appeared more or less simultaneously in leading American newspapers, showing very clearly how their problem stands at present. The first was a report to the latest UFO sighting by a pilot who was flying in an aircraft to Puerto Rico with 44 passengers. While he was over the ocean, he saw a fiery round object shining with greenish-white light, coming towards him at great speed. At first he thought it was a jet-propelled aircraft, but soon, that, but soon saw that it was some unusual and unknown object. In order to avoid collision, he pulled his aircraft into such a steep climb that the passengers were shot out of their seats and tumbled over one another. Four of them received injuries requiring hospital attention. Seven other aircraft strung out along the same route of about 300 miles sighted the same object. The other article, entitled No Flying Saucers, U.S. Expert Says, concerns the categorical statement made by Dr. Hugh L. Dryden, director of the National Advisory Committee for Aeronautics, that UFOs do not exist. One cannot but respect the unflinching skepticism of Dr. Dryden. It gives stout-hearted expression to the feeling that such preposterous rumors are the, an, offense, an offense to human dignity. If we close our eyes a little so as to overlook the certain details, it is possible to side with the reasonable opinions of the majority in whose name Dr. Dryden speaks and to regard the thousands of UFOs report and their uproar they have created as a visionary rumor and to be treated accordingly. They would boil down objectively to an adamantly impressive collection of mistaken observation and conclusions into which subjective psychic assumptions have been projected. But if it is the case of psychic psychological projections, there must be a psycho psychic cause for it. One can hardly suppose that anything of such worldwide incidents as the UFO legend is purely fortuitous and of no importance whatsoever. The many thousands of individual testimonies must have an equally extensive causal basis. When an assertion of this kind is corroborated practically everywhere, we are driven to assume that our corresponding motive must be present everywhere, too. Through visionary rumors, the visionary rumors may have may be caused or accompanied by all manner of outward circumstances. They are based essentially on omnipresent emotional foundations, in this case a psychological situation common to all mankind. The basis for this kind of rumor is an emotional tension having its cause in a situation for collective distress or danger or in a vital psychic need. This condition undoubtedly exists today in so far as the whole world is suffering from the strain of Russian politics and their still unpredictable consequence. In the individual too, such phenomenon as abnormal convictions, uh, uh, visions, illusions, etc., only occur when she is suffering from a psychic dissociation, that is, when there is a split between the conscious attitude and the unconscious contents opposed to it. Precisely because the conscious mind does not know about them and is therefore confronted with a situation from which there seem to be no way out, these strange contents cannot be integrated directly but seek to express themselves indirectly, thus giving rise to unexpected and apparently inexplicable opinions, beliefs, illusions, visions, and so forth. Any unusual natural occurrence, such as meteors, comets, rains of blood, a calf with two heads, and such like abortions, are interpreted as menacing omens, or else signs are seen in the heavens. 
Things can be seen by many people independently of one another or even simultaneously, which are not psychically real. Also, the association process of many people often have a parallelism in time and space, with the result that different people simultaneously and independently of one another can produce the same new ideas as has happened numerous times in history. In addition, there are many cases in which the same collective cause produces identical or similar effects, i.e., the same visionary images and interpretations in the very people who are at least are least prepared for such phenomena and least inclined to believe them. Footnote. Amy Michel remarks that UFOs are mostly seen by people who do not believe in them or who regard them the whole problem with indifference. End footnote. This fact give the, gives the eyewitness accounts an air of particular credibility. It is usually emphasized that the witness is above suspicion because she was has never distinguished she was never distinguished for her lively imagination or credulousness, but on the contrary, for her cool judgment and critical reason. In just these cases, the unconscious has to resort to particularly drastic measures in order to make its contents perceived. It does this most vividly by projection, by extra, extrapolating, extrapolating its contents into an, onto an object, which then mirrors what, what had previously lain hidden in the unconscious. Projection can be observed at work everywhere, in mental illness, ideas of persecution and hallucinations, and so-called normal people who see the moat in their brother's eye without seeing the beam in their own, and finally, in extreme form, in political propaganda. Projections have what we might call different ranges, according to whether they stem from merely personal conditions or from deeper collective ones. Personal repressions and things of which we are unconscious manifest themselves in our immediate environment, in our circle of relatives and acquaintances. Collective contents such as religions, religious, philosophical, political, or social conflicts select projection carriers of a corresponding kind, Freemasons, Jesuits, Jews, capitalists, Bolsheviks, imperialists, etc. In the threatening situation of the world to get today, when people are beginning to see that everything is at stake, the projection-centered fantasy soars beyond the realm of earthly or organizations and powers into the heavens, into interstellar space, from which the rulers of human fate, the gods, once had their abode on the, in the planets. Our earthly world is split into two halves, and nobody knows where a helpful solution is to come from. Even people would never have thought that a religious problem could be a serious matter that concerned them personally are beginning to ask themselves fundamental questions. Under these circumstances, it would not be at all surprising if those sections of the community who ask themselves nothing were visited by visions, that is, by widespread myth, seriously believed in by some and rejected as absurd by others. Eyewitnesses of unimpeachable honesty therefore announce the quote, signs in the heavens, unquote, which they have seen with their own eyes, quote, unquote, and the marvelous things they have experienced which pass human understanding. All these reports have naturally resulted in a clamorous demand for explanation. Initial extent attempts to explain the UFOs as Russian or American inter invention soon came to grief on their apparently weightless behavior, which is unknown in Earth dwellers. Human fantasy already toying with the idea of space trips to the moon, therefore had no hesitation in assuming that intelligent beings of a higher order had learned how to counteract gravitation, gra gravitation and, by dint of using interstellar magnetic fields as sources of power, to travel through space with the speed of light. The recent atomic explosions on the Earth, it was conjectured, had aroused the attention of these so very much more advanced dwellers on Mars or Venus who were worried about possible chain reactions and the consequent destruction of our planet. Since such possibility would constitute a catastrophic threat to our neighboring planets, their inhabitants felt compelled to observe how things were developing on Earth, fairly aware of the tremendous cataclysm our clumsy nuclear experience, experiments might unleash.
The fact that the UFOs neither land on Earth nor show the least inclination to get into the communication with human beings is met by the explanation that these visitors, despite their superior knowledge, are not at all certain of being well received on Earth, for which reason they carefully avoid all intelligent contact with humans but because they, as befitted superior beings, conduct themselves quite inoffensively, they would do the earth no harm and are satisfied with an objective inspection of airfields and atomic installations. Just why these higher beings, who show such a burning interest in the fate of the earth, have still not found some way of communicating with us after ten years, despite their knowledge of language, languages, remains shrouded in darkness. Other explanations have... Therefore, to be sought, for instance, that a planet has got into difficulties, perhaps through the drying up of its water supplies, or loss of oxygen, or overpopulation, or looking for a pied à terre. The, reconna the reconnaissance patrols are going to work with the utmost care and circumspection, despite the fact that they have been given the benefit of performance in the heavens for hundreds, if not thousands, of years. Since World War II, they have appeared in masses, obviously because an imminent landing is planned. Recently, their harmlessness has been doubted. There are also stories by so-called witnesses who declare that they have seen UFOs landing with, of course, English-speaking occupants. These space guests are sometimes idealized figures among the lines of technological angels who are concerned for our welfare, sometimes dwarves, with enormous heads bursting with intel intelligence, and sometimes Lemurlike creatures covered with hair and equipped with claws or dwarfish monsters clad in armor and looking like insects. There are even eyewitnesses like Mr. Adamski, who re relates that he had flown in a UFO and made a round trip of the moon in a few hours. He brings us the astonishing news that the side of the moon turned away from us contains atmosphere, water, forests, and settlements, without being in the least perturbed by the moon's skittishness in turning just her unhospitable side towards the earth. This physical monstrosity of a story was actually swallowed by a cultivated and well-meaning person like Edgar Sievers. Considering the notorious camera-mindedness of Americans, it is surprising how few authentic photos of UFOs seem to exist, especially as many of them are said to have been observed in s for several hours at relatively close quarters. I myself happen to know someone who saw a UFO with hundreds of other people in Guatemala. Guatemala. He had his cameras with him, but in the excitement he completely forgot to take a photo, although it was daytime and the UFO remained visible for an hour. I have no reason to doubt the honesty of his, of his report. He, was merely, he has merely strengthened my impression that UFOs are somehow not photographic. Uh, photogenic, sorry. As one can see from all this observation and interpretation of UFOs has already led to the formation of a regular legend. Quite apart from the thousands of newspaper reports and articles, there is now a whole literature on the subject, some of it humbug, some of it serious. The UFOs themselves, however, do not appear to have been impressed. As the least observations show, they con continue their way undeterred. Be that as it may, one thing is certain. They have, they have become a living myth. We now have a golden opportunity to see how a legend is formed and how it is difficult, how in a difficult and dark time for humanity, a miraculous tale grows up of an attempted intervention by extraterrestrial heavenly powers. And this, at the very time when human fantasy is seriously considering the possibility of space travel and of visiting or even invading other planets. We on our side want to fly to the moon or to Mars, and on their side the inhabitants of other planets in our system or even of the fixed stars want to fly to us. We are, at least, are conscious of our space-conquering aspirations. But that, as a corresponding extra extraterrestrial tendency, exists in a pure mythological conjecture, i.e. projection. Sensationalism, love of adventure, technological odyssey, intellectual curiosity may appear to be sufficient motives for our futuristic fantasies. But the impulse to spin such fantasies, especially when they take such a serious form, witness the Sputniks, springs from an underlying cause, namely the situation of distress, and the vital need of what goes with it. It could easily be conjectured that the earth is growing too small for us, that humanity would like to escape from its prison, where we are threatened not only by the hydrogen atom bomb, but at a still deeper level, by the prodigious increase in the population figures, which gives us cause for serious concern. 
there is a problem which people do not like to talk about, or then only with optimistic references to the incalculable possibilities of intensive food production, as if this were anything more than a postponement of a final solution. As a precautionary measure, the Indian government has granted half a million pounds for birth control propaganda, while the Russians exploit the labor camp system as one way of skimming off the dreaded excess of births. Through the highly civilized countries of the West, though the highly civilized countries of the West know how to help themselves in other ways, the immediate danger does not come from them, but from the undeveloped people of Asia and Africa. This is not the place to discuss the problems of how far the two world wars were an outlet for the pressing problem of keeping down the population at all costs. Nature has many ways of disposing her surplus. Men's living space is, in fact, continually shrinking, and for many reasons the optimism has long been exceeded. The danger of catastrophe goes in proportion as the expanding population imp populations impinge on one another. Congestion, congestion creates fear, which looks for help from extraterrestrial sources since it cannot be found on Earth. Hence there appear signs in the heavens superior beings in the kind of spaceships devised by our technological fantasy. From a fear whose cause is far from being fully understood and therefore not conscious, there arise explanatory projections which purport to find the cause in all manner of secondary phenomena, however unsuitable. Some of these projections are so obvious that it seems almost superfluous to dig any deeper. But if we want to understand a mass rumor which, it appears, is even accompanied by collective visions, we must not remain satisfied with all too rational and superficiality obvious motives. The cause must strike at the roots of our existence if it is to explain such an extraordinary phenomenon like the UFOs. Although they were observed as rare curiosities in earlier centuries, they merely give rise to the usual local rumors. The universal mass rumor was reserved for our enlightenment rationalistic age. The widespread fantasy about a destruction of the world at the end of the first millennium was a metaphysical in origin and needed no UFOs in order to appear rational. Heaven's intervention was quite consistent with the Weltstandig of the age. But nowadays, public opinion would hardly be inclined to resort to the hypothesis of a metaphysical act otherwise innumerable parsons would have already been preaching about the warning signs in heaven. Our Weltanschlang does not expect anything of this sort. We would be much more inclined to think of the possibility of psychic disturbance in the interventions, especially of our psychic equilibrium, has become something of a problem since the last world war. In this respect, there is increasing uncertainty. Even our historians can no longer make use of the conventional techniques in evaluating and explaining the developments that have overtaken Europe in the last few decades, but must admit that psychological and pathological factors are beginning to widen the horizons of historiography in an alarming way. The growing interest which the thinking public consequently evidences or evinces in psychology has already aroused the displeasure of the academy, academies and of incompetent specialists. In spite of the palpable resistance to psychology emanating from these circles, psychologists who are conscious of their responsibilities should not be dissuaded from critically examining a mass phenomenon like the UFOs, since the apparent impossibility of the report suggests to common sense that the most likely explanation lies in psychic disturbance. We shall therefore turn our attention to the psychic aspect of the phenomenon. For this purpose, we shall briefly review the central statements of the rumor. Certain objects are seen in the Earth's atmosphere, both by day and night, which are unlike any known meteorological phenomena. They are not meteors, not misidentified fixed stars, not temperature inversions, not cloud formations, not main migrating birds, not aerial balloons, not balls of fire, and certainly not the delirious products of intoxication or fever, nor the plain lies of eyewitnesses. What, as a rule, is seen is a body of round, shape, disc-like, or spherical, glowing or shining fierce, fire, firely in different colors, or more seldom, a cigar-shaped or cylindrical figure of various sizes. Footnote. The more ra rarely reported cigar-like form 
may have a zeppelin for a model. The obvious phallic comparisons, i.e. translation into sexual language, springs naturally to the lips of the people. Berliners, for instance, refer to the cigar-shaped UFO as a holy ghost, and the Swiss military have an even more outspoken name for observation, balloons. And a footnote. It is reported that occasionally they are invisible to the naked eye, but leave a blip on their radar skin. The round bodies in particular are figures such as the unconscious produces in dreams, visions, etc. In the latter case, they are to be regarded as symbols representing in visual form some thought that could not, that what some thought that was not thought consciously, but is merely potentially present in the unconscious, in an invisible form, and attains visibility only through the process of becoming conscious. The visible form, however, expresses the meaning of the unconscious content only approximately. In practice, the meaning has to be completed by amplificatory interpretation. The unavoidable errors that result can be eliminated only through the principle of waiting on events. That is to say, we obtain a cons consistent and reliable I'm sorry, and readable text by comparing sequences of dreams dreamt by different individuals. The figures in the rumor can be subjected to the same principle of dream interpretation. If we apply them to the round object, whether it be a disc or a sphere, we at once get an analogy with a symbol of totality well known to all students in depth psychology, namely the mandala, Sanskrit for circle. This is not by any means a new invention for it can be found in all epochs and in all places, always with the same meaning, and reappears time and again, independently of tradition, in modern individuals as a protective or atmospheric circle, whether in the form of, prehistoric, of the prehistoric sun wheel, or the magic circle, or the alchemical microscope, or the modern, modern symbol of order, which or organizes and encloses the psychic totalitary, totality. As I have shown elsewhere, footnote, the more rarely reported sig oh no that's wrong sorry not that's not the right footnote footnote on mandala symbolism okay so end of footnote as I have shown elsewhere in the course of the centuries the mandala has developed into a definitely psychological totality symbol as the history of alchemy proves I would like to show how the mandala appears in the modern person by setting the dream of a six-year-old girl. She dreamt she stood at the entrance of a large unknown building. There a fairy was waiting for her, for her who led in her inside into a long colonnade and conducted to a, just, into a sort of central chamber with similar colonnades converging from all sides. The fairy stepped into the center and changed herself into a tall flame. Three snakes crawled around the flame as if circumambulating it. Here we have a classic archetypal childhood dream, such as is not only is is not only dreamt fairly often, but is sometimes drawn or painted without suggestion any suggestion from outside, for the evident purpose of warding off disagreeable or disturb, disturbing family influences and preserving the inner balance. In so far as the mandal encompasses, protects, and defends the psychic totality against the outside influences and seeks to unite the inner opposites, it is at the same time a distinct individuation symbol and was known as such to even medieval alchemy. The soul is supposed to have the form of a sphere on the analogy of Plato's word soul, and we met the same symbol in modern dreams. By reason of its antiquity, this symbol leads us to the heavenly spheres, to Plato's supra-celestial place, where the ideas of all things are stored up. Hence, there would be nothing against the naive interpretation of the UFOs of souls. Naturally, they do not represent our modern conception of the soul, but rather an involuntary archetypal or mythological conception of the unconscious content, a rotundum, as the alchemists call it, that expression of totality of the individual. I have defined this spontaneous image as a symbolic representation of the self, by which I mean not the ego, but the totalitary, the totalitary composed of the conscious and the unconscious. I am not alone in this, as the Hermetic philosopher of the Middle Ages have, had already arrived at this very similar conclusion. The archetypal character of this idea is borne out by its spontaneous reoccurrence in the modern individuals 
who know nothing of any such tradition, any more than these around them. Even people who might know of it never imagined that their children could dream of anything so remote as Hermaic philosophy. In this matter, the deepest and darkest ignorance prevails, which of course the most unsuitable, is the most unsuitable vehicle for mythologic tradition. If the round shining objects that appear in the sky be regarded as visions, we can hardly avoid interpreting them as archetypal images. They would then be involuntary automatic projections based on instinct and as little as any other psychic manifestations or symptoms can be can they be, and as little as of any other psychic manifestations or symptoms can they be dismissed as meaningless or merely fortuitous. Anyone with the requisite historical and psychological knowledge knows that the circular symbols have played an important role in every age in our own sphere of culture, for instance, where they not o where they were not only soul symbols, but God images. There is an old saying that God is a circle whose center is everywhere and the circumference nowhere. God in his omni omniscience, omnipotence, and omnipresence is a totality symbol par excellence, something round, complete, and perfect. Epiphanies of this sort are, in, in the tradition, often associated with fire and light. On the antique level, therefore, the UFOs could easily be conceived as gods. They are impressive manifestations of totality, whose simple, round form portrays the archetype of the soul, which, as we know from experience, plays the chief role in uniting apparently irreconcil irreconcilable opposites, and is therefore best suited to the compensate the mid the split mindedness of our age. It has a particularly important role to play among the other archetypes in that it is primarily the regulator and order of the chaotic states, giving the personality the greatest possible unity and wholeness. It creates the image of the divided <coughs> human personality, the primordial man or anthropos, a chinyin, true or whole man, and Elijah who calls down fire from heaven rises up to heaven in a f and rises up to hibernate heaven in a fiery chariot. A footnote. Significantly enough, Elijah also appears as an eagle who spies out unrighteousness on earth from above. End of footnote. So, and is a forerunner along of the Messiah, the dogmatized figure of Christ, as well as Kadir, the virgin. One footnote um, concerning rebirth. Okay, that's enough. The verdant one, who is another parallel to Elijah. Like him, he wanders over the earth as a human personification of Allah. Of Allah. <clears throat> the present world situation is calculated as never before to arouse expectations of a redeeming supernatural event. If these expectations have not dared to show themselves very clearly, there is sim this is simply because no one is deeply rooted enough in the tradition of earlier centuries to consider an intervention from heaven as a matter of course. We have indeed strayed far from the metaphysical certainties of the Middle Ages, but not so far that our historical and psychological background is empty of all metaphysical hope. Footnote. It is common and totally unjustified misunderstanding on the part of scientifically trained people to say that I regard psychic background as something metaphysical, while on the other hand the theologians accuse me of psycholo psychologizing metaphysics. Both are wide of the mark. I am, I am an empiricist who keeps within the boundaries set for him by the theory of knowledge. And a Conscious, consciously, however, rationalistic enlightenment predominates, and this abhors all learning leanings towards the occult. Desperate efforts are made for a respiration of our Christian faith, but we cannot get back to that limited worldview which in former times left room for metaphysical intervention. Nor can we resuscitate a genuine Christian belief in an afterlife or an equally Christian hope for an imminent end of the world that would put a definite stop to the regrettable error of creation. Belief in this world and in the power of man has, despite assurances to the contrary, become a practical and, for the time being, irrefragable truth. This attitude on the part of the overwhelming majority provides the most favorable basis for a projection that is, for a manifestation of the unconscious background. Undeterred by rationalistic criticism, it thrusts itself into the forefront in the form of symbolic rumor, accompanied and reinforced by the appropriate visions, and in so doing, 
activates an archetype that has always expressed order, deliverance, salvation, and wholeness. It is characteristic of our time that, in contrast with its previous expressions, the archetype should now take the form of an object of technological constru construction in order to avoid the odiousness of a mythological personification. Anything that looks technological goes down without difficulty in, with modern people. The possibility of space travel makes the unpopular idea of a metaphysical intervention much more acceptable. The apparent weightlessness of the UFOs is, however, rather hard to digest, but then our own physicists have discovered so many things that border on the miraculous. Why should not more advanced star dwellers have discovered a way to counteract gravitation and reach the speed of light, if not more? Nuclear physics has begotten into the layman's head an uncertainty of judgment that far exceed, exceeds that of the physics, physics and makes things appear possible which but a short while ago would have been declared nonsensical. Consequently, the UFOs can easily be regarded and believed in as a physicist's miracle. I still remember with misgivings the time when I was convinced that something heavier than air could not fly, only to be taught a painful lesson. Nevertheless, the apparently physical nature of the UFOs creates such insoluble puzzles for even the best brains, and on the other hand, has built up such an impressive legend that one feels tempted to take them as 99% psychic product and subject them accordingly to the usual psychological interpretation. Should it be that an unknown physical phenomenon is an outward cause of the myth, this would then detract nothing from the myth, for many myths have meteorological and other natural phenomena as accompanying causes which by no means explain them. The myth is essentially a product of the unconscious archetype and is therefore a symbol which requires psychological interpretation. For primitive, primi for primitive man, any object, for instance, an old tin that has been thrown away, can suddenly assume the importance of a fetish. This effect is obviously not inherent in the tin, but in its psychic product. So that's the end of the chapter of UFOs as rumors, and the next chapter is UFOs and dreams. It's quite long. Um, so I'm interested in this because I've been doing work developing a well-being metric for artificial intelligence or autonomous autonomous intelligence systems, um, where this is something that is purely a projection of humans, and we're not very good at being conscious of our unconscious. Um, and so what kind of AI are we already creating? Um, something that's pretty powerfully damaging, as we've seen already. And um, I think that piece of instead of trying to just create AI that is positive, of really looking at the negative and seeing where we can inform a complete view and how we go about guidelines or um, metrics to measure and guide the successful implementation of AI is what I'm interested in, uh, among other things. Of course, just interested in young. Well, I hope you enjoyed this.